presence. All right, 1 Samuel chapter 21, 1 Samuel 21, beginning at verse 1, and we're reading here about David. And as this chapter begins, David really has given up on ever being safe. Saul, King Saul, has been hunting him, and David is literally on the run for his life, and he's not trusting a soul. And that's where we begin in verse 1. It says, David came to Nob, to Ahimelech the priest. And Ahimelech came to meet David, trembling, and said to him, Why are you alone and no one with you? David said to Ahimelech the priest, The king has charged me with a matter and said to me, Let no one know anything of the matter about which I send you and with which I have charged you. I have made an appointment with the young men for such and such a place. Now, just so you know, that was a complete lie. (laughs) Okay, Skip down to verse 7. Says, now a certain man of the servants of Saul was there that day, detained before the Lord. His name was Doeg the Edomite, the chief of Saul's herdsmen. And David said to Ahimelech, Have you not here a spear or a sword at hand? For I have brought neither my sword nor my weapons with me, because the king's business required haste. David was on no business from the king. He was simply fleeing. And the priest said, The sword of Goliath the Philistine, whom you struck down in the valley of Elah, behold, it is here wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. That was the priest's clothing. If you will take that, take it, for there is none but that here. And David said, there is none like that. Give it to me. And David rose and fled that day from Saul and went to Achish, the king of Gath. And the servants of Achish said to him, isn't this David, the king of the land? Did they not sing to one another of him in dances? Saul has struck down his thousands and David his ten thousands. And David took these words to heart and was much afraid of Achish, the king of Gath. So he changed his behavior before them and pretended to be insane in their hands and made marks on the doors of the gate and let his spittle run down his beard. And then Achish said to his servants, Behold, you see the man is mad. Why then have you brought him to me? Do I lack madmen that you've brought this fellow to behave as a madman in my presence? Shall this fellow come into my house? Let's continue onward into chapter 22. It says, David departed from there and escaped to the cave of Adullam. And when his brothers and all his father's house heard it, they went down there to him. And everyone who was in distress, everyone who was in debt, and everyone who was bitter in soul gathered to him. And he became commander over them. And there were with him about 400 men. David went from there to Mizpah of Moab, and he said to the king of Moab, Please let my father and my mother stay with you until I know what God will do for me. And he left them with the king of Moab, and they stayed with him all the time that David was in the stronghold. Then the prophet Gad said to David, Don't remain in the stronghold. Depart and go into the land of Judah. So David departed and went into the forest of Hereth. Jump ahead with me, if you would, to chapter 23, and we'll read just a couple verses there to finish. 1 Samuel 23, verse 1 says, Now they told David, Behold, the Philistines are fighting against Keilah and are robbing the threshing floors. Therefore David inquired of the Lord, Shall I go and attack these Philistines? And the Lord said to David, go and attack the Philistines and save Keilah. My message this morning is entitled, Whenever I am afraid, I will trust in you. Whenever I am afraid, I will trust in you. Let's pray and let's ask God's blessing as we look into the word of the Lord this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for gathering us this morning around your holy word. Jesus, you said that the word of God is like seed, so... Would you touch our hearts in these next few minutes? Would you let our hearts be good soil that can bear fruit from the seed of the word of God? Lord Jesus, you said the words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. So would you please send your Holy Spirit now, minister life to us out of the word in Jesus name. Amen and amen. Over the last few weeks, we've been sharing stories of faith. We've been looking at great heroes of the Bible and exploring the defining moments of faith in their lives. What can we learn from them? And how can their stories encourage us today? We've seen that God makes us a promise, but then he leads us through a process until we receive the fulfillment 
of that promise. You know that God uses the process in our lives to make us people of a strong faith, people with confidence in his faithfulness. Suffering Job spoke in faith about this process, and he said, he knows the way that I'm taking. And when he has tested me, I will come forth like gold. Right now at harvest time, we're in our own defining moment of faith. We're trusting God for the fulfillment of his promises to us. We're believing God for over $250,000 that we still need to come in so we can obtain our temporary certificate of occupancy. We believe, and I know you believe, that it's harvest time at harvest time and that God is causing us to inherit his promises. So we're asking that you please continue to stand with us in your prayers every day for phase two. Amen. And today we're going to look at a defining moment of faith in the life of David, some years before he became King David. How significant was this man, David, in the plan of God? God said, David is a man after my own heart who will do all my will. Wouldn't you love that to be your testimony in heaven, for God to look at us and say, that one will do all my will. God promised David that he would never lack a man to sit on the throne of Israel. We see this even in the Christmas story, do you know? When the angel Gabriel told Mary that she would give birth to Messiah, Gabriel said to Mary, the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. Of his kingdom there will be no end. Church, I hope you know this morning that Jesus is coming back to rule the world. And he's not coming to reign at the United Nations down the highway there. He's not coming to sit in Washington or Beijing. But he's coming to sit on the throne of David forever. Amen. The Bible shows us that Jesus, now even risen from the dead in glory, is not ashamed to be called, to call himself the offspring of David. God highly honored David that way because David wanted to honor God in a way that few people ever have. Yeah. If you study David's life, read his biography, study the Psalms, you'll see his tremendous wisdom and faith. But although David was a great man, of course, David wasn't born a great man. He had to grow into that powerful confidence in God that we admire so much. And along the way, David had a defining moment of faith that would catapult him to another level. It would set the course for the rest of his life. Not only would David overcome fear, he would become a better man, a better leader, and he would start to manage his life by the leading of the Holy Spirit. Church, to be frank, the story of David's trip to the Philistine city of Gath is a strange tale. David was on the run from King Saul. Saul had become intensely jealous of David, and he turned against him, even though David was now his own son-in-law. Knowing the danger that he faced, David came to a point here where he left everyone he knew, and he decided to conceal himself somewhere. Choosing Gath for a hideout, however, was a big mistake. David should have known that the Philistines would spot him immediately. Can you imagine David's panic? To keep his head where it belonged, which was where God put it, David quickly pretended to be insane. He started scratching on the gate of the city like an animal and drooling on his beard. Do you know, the Bible scholars tell us that no sane Israelite would deliberately defile his own beard. In that part of the world, in the cultures of those days, that was a tremendous mark of shame and disgrace that anything would happen to your beard. Believe it or not, and there's a story similar to this in the scripture, that disgracing someone's beard was such a defilement of someone's manhood that it could actually lead to a war. Can you imagine? David was a great singer, but I guess his acting was just as good. Because the Philistine king said, and it's kind of comical actually, he said, hey, I've got enough crazy people here around me already. 
So he sent David packing. He sent him away unharmed. And of course, you and I know that that was God's mercy. And considering that he was on the run for his life, perhaps we should hesitate to judge David, but it's a shocking story nonetheless. It takes one of the Bible's greatest heroes and it portrays him in a very unfavorable light. Do you know that the Bible shows us our heroes of faith, warts and all? Acting skills aside, how did David survive this episode and how did he emerge from it more ready than ever before to lead God's people? How did he go from the ultimate bad road trip into being one of Israel's greatest teachers and prophets? And what can you and I learn from his strange trip? You might not have ever ended up in a place like Gath, but I would guarantee that most of us have faced times in our lives when our fear has driven us to some desperate measures. Maybe you're here today this morning and you actually do feel very trapped in a bad situation. And maybe you even feel far from the Lord today because if we're honest, you, you might say that it's your own choices that helped to create the mess that you're in. What hope is there for you if that's you today? I see here that David overcame by having a faith that said, whenever I am afraid, I will trust in you. That's so powerful. I want you to repeat that line. Whenever I am afraid, I will trust in you. David took four steps of faith in God, and each one of them was to counteract a different weakness that you and I all share. Let's look at them together, and I pray that the Holy Spirit would give us grace to be set free also, like David was. Four steps of faith that David took, and the first one is this. When you're afraid, trust in the living God. Don't give in to foolishness. Trust in the living God. Don't give in to foolishness. Church, David was walking in foolishness here, forgetting that God was alive, Forgetting that God cared about him, David began to start acting rashly. He made foolish mistakes because he failed to seek the Lord who loved him. In fact, David took no counsel before leaving Israel. I don't know if you noticed, but David didn't seek out any prophet. Once before, in trouble, he had gone to see Samuel, the prophet, to complain about how King Saul was persecuting him. But now David wasn't looking for Samuel. David knew that wonderful promise of God, of course, that you and I know. That if you meditate in God's word day and night, and if you do God's word, then God says you will enjoy what? Good success. What a powerful promise that is, amen? But we don't see David meditating on the word in order to get any wisdom about what to do next. Not only did David take no counsel, David went further and he isolated himself. He had just cut off contact with Jonathan, his best friend, and he'd even cut off contact with his family. He left his men behind and he headed off to the city of Gath alone. Do you know that we read here, we don't even read that David prayed. Have you ever known somebody, church, who would not listen to reason? Have you ever known somebody that only took their own advice? When you fail to pray, when you isolate yourself, listen, when you isolate yourself from the saints, when you take no counsel, you give birth to bad ideas. You do things that can only end badly. And what did David end up doing? Well, that's a bad idea right there. It's just about as bad as David's. If you ever go to Africa, do not dress as a zebra. And what David did was almost just as unwise as those two guys. David went to the most dangerous place he could have gone to. He went to the enemy to the Philistines. Did David not remember that for years he had been making a living by killing Philistines, including Goliath 
their giant champion. You know, David was number one that year on Spotify, iTunes, and Google Play. He had the biggest song of the year. It was called, David Killed 10,000 Philistines. With David's reputation, did he really think that he wouldn't be recognized? Bible commentators tell us he might have been offering himself out, you know, to the Philistines to hire him as a mercenary. And that was not an unusual thing for Hebrew men to do. However, David was David. And as for Gath, did I mention that Gath was the hometown of Goliath? And in one of the worst all-time ideas, David went looking for work in Goliath's hometown, carrying Goliath's sword. Church, when I forget that God, listen, is actively working for my good, I start to lean on my own understanding. When I don't let God direct my paths, I will end up behaving erratically. David was failing to acknowledge the Lord in all his ways so that God might direct his paths. And he learned the hard way that believers need to do things God's way. Fortunately for David and for us, David lived to tell us all about it. In fact, David actually wrote two psalms about his very bad day in Gath. When we read them, we can see the faith that helped him to escape. Now, Psalm 56 is one of those psalms. Psalm 56 is a beautiful song of faith, and the Bible says David wrote it when the Philistines captured him in Gath. David might have been playing the fool on the outside. We read that. But what was David saying on the inside when the Philistines grabbed him. And in verse 3 of Psalm 56, David was saying, Whenever I am afraid, I will trust in you. Notice David now was not saying, I will trust my own ideas. He said, I will trust in you. Church, trust your heavenly Father, the one who cares for you. Don't withdraw from his word. Don't stop seeking his face. You see, for just a little while, David forgot that his God was the God who said, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. And no matter what kind of situation you find yourself in today, it may be something that's too hard for the doctor, too hard for the accountant, too hard for the lawyer to fix. Things may look rough, but even if you're in that situation because you went your own way, trust in the Lord because he can bring you out. Whenever you're afraid, don't give in to foolishness. Trust the living God. Four steps of faith David took when he was afraid. The second one is this. When you're afraid, trust in the word of God. Don't give in to fear. Trust in God's word. Don't give in to fear. You know, even though the Lord had promised good things to David, he was walking in fear and he was walking in discouragement instead of trusting in God for his future. In Psalm 56, after he was captured, David said, whenever I'm afraid, I will trust in you. And then he went on to say, I will praise his word. I will not fear. But before he could praise God's word again, David needed to relearn a few things. You see, persecution had led David to think that there was no safe place, that there was no friendly person to be found anywhere in Israel. And I don't know if you noticed it in the passage we read, but just the simple fact that David had a connection to King Saul was enough to make Ahimelech, the priest, afraid of David. Yeah. You see, Saul had become such a frightening figure in people's minds that even the sight of his servants, even the sight of David, could cause literal trembling in the high priest of God. If people were so terrified of Saul, who was now chasing David, where could David go? So he decided he must leave the country entirely. 
It didn't help David's spirits any to see this man, Doeg. He was not a Jew. He was not an Israelite. He was a man of Edom, and he was one of Saul's top servants. And Doeg certainly knew that David was now on Israel's ten most wanted list. And so David realized that the news of his whereabouts would quickly get back to Saul. Off to Gath, David went, forgetting God's word of promise. David had a powerful promise over his life, and so do you. Back in 1 Samuel 16, when we first meet David, when we encounter him in Scripture for the very first time, we read that God sent the prophet Samuel to anoint David as king to replace King Saul. And God told the prophet, arise, anoint him, because this is the one. Let me ask you, friends, was God not powerful enough to cause his intentions to come to pass? Of course he was. But inside of David's heart that day, meditating on his fears had replaced prayers about his future and his ministry. David was no longer meditating on the word. He was no longer pondering God's purposes. Why did David go to Gath? Well, whether it was because he went as a possible mercenary or for some other reason, we don't know. What it really meant was that he was giving up. Maybe he wasn't giving up forever, but he told himself, well, for now, I'm just going to throw in the towel. And because of that persecution and because of not encouraging himself out of God's word, he was willing at that moment to write off years, maybe decades of his life, convinced that nothing would ever change. As if he didn't have a living God who had promised to establish him. In his fear, David forgot to look at what God had already done. And you and I do the same. You see, actually, God had been doing quite an awful lot in David's life and heart. God all along had been training David and giving him the wisdom on his heart that he needed to be a king. The scripture says when we first meet David, it said that David was already, get get this, David was already prudent in his speech as a teenager. I'm still working on trying to be prudent in my speech at 55. (laughs) And the scripture says that David was already prudent in his speech as a teenager. That's the testimony that people gave to King Saul about him. But you know, God kept growing him. And later on, once he came into the service of King Saul, it says this. It says, David behaved wisely everywhere that Saul sent him. But he kept growing. It says afterwards that David behaved wisely in all his ways. And finally, it says before this that David behaved more wisely than all the servants of Saul. Do you see that progression? So here David is. He's maybe only about 21 years old at this time. And God has already shaped him into the wisest leader in Israel. And David didn't know it. David did not see how God had been working in him all along. Fear. Fear kept David from perceiving how far God had already taken him. Church, we need to encourage ourselves sometimes. You need to look back and see where you were two and five and eight and 12 years ago. Be encouraged because he who began that good work in you is going to continue to perform it. Amen. You know, in fact, even though David was not the king yet, his legend had become so great. Did you notice that the Philistines thought he already was, to use their expression, the king of the land? David's skill and his wisdom had already made him such a towering figure in the mind of Israel's enemies that they considered King Saul to be yesterday's man, somebody of little consequence in comparison to the man that was standing right in front of them. But now alone and flailing, David would experience true fear. He was captured, he was seized, he was taken. And you might not have caught this little detail, but the Bible says he pretended madness in their hands. Because he forgot the promises of God for the very first time in his life, 
we read in the scriptures that David experienced fear. Church, think about this with me. Everything that David had already been through, lions and bears and a 10-foot giant, we never read that David feared. When he dodged uh, spears that Saul was throwing at him. When he escaped from a squad of assassins. When he had to escape out the window of his own house. We never read that David was afraid. Somebody needs to hear this today, church. Listen, it was by grasping for a false safety that David actually became afraid for the first time. We're sympathetic to his plight, of course. I mean, isn't it just possible that David simply got worn down by the relentless, the ongoing nature of Saul's attacks? Of course. Who wouldn't be worn down by something like that? But David allowed his heart to be overwhelmed, and it stopped him from laying a hold, from keeping his grasp on the good promises God had spoken over his life. Psalm 56 says that David recovered his faith. He banished his fear just in the nick of time. It says, I will praise his word. I will not fear. That's the antidote for our fears as well, yours and mine. It will strengthen our faith. It will bring us out of discouragement. In the book of Acts, I read that the word of grace, it says, can build you up. And give you an inheritance. In Romans it says, faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. Peter says, you've been given some exceedingly great and precious promises. They are words, Peter taught us, that minister the life of God to us like nothing else can. Forget that word and you will succumb to fear like even David did who had never previously known fear. David recovered and he said, I will praise that word of God. Read his word. Meditate on it. Think about his promises. Just like David, some of us do need to remember that God will continue to perform that good work until the day of Jesus Christ. Whenever you're afraid, don't give in to fear Trust in the word of God. Four steps of faith David took when he was afraid. Trust in God. Trust in the word of God. And third, when you're afraid, trust in the power of God. Don't rely upon the flesh. Trust in God's power. Don't rely upon the flesh. David, at this point, was walking in the flesh. What do I mean by that? Instead of leaning on the power of the Lord... David had turned a corner now where he was leaning on his own strength, on his own experience, on his own cunning. David prayed again in Psalm 56, thinking back to how he had escaped that day. David said, what can flesh do to me? What can flesh do to me? You see, by God's grace, David remembered in the nick of time that the power of God was stronger than his enemies. Church, we know, don't we, that the mightiest of men is nothing compared to the arm of the Lord. But it seems that David had started over time to think that he should meet strength with strength. That he should match the enemy's strength with his own strength. And so we see him now moving out in the power of the flesh. Moving in mere human strength and human craftiness. You notice that he used deceit with Ahimelech, the priest. Saul hadn't sent him on any errand. David came to the priest looking for the sword of Goliath, and he lied to get it. We're not accustomed to thinking of David this way, but David had grown into a very skillful liar. He had deceived King Saul on a number of occasions rather than appealing to Saul, rather than being forthright with Saul. Now David was telling lies in order to make things happen and in order to get results. Carnal thinking infected his formerly pure soul. And now, when he looked upon his past victories, somehow, in some sense, he saw those victories as his own, forgetting God's involvement. 
He came hunting for the sword of Goliath, a reminder of his most famous triumph, when instead what David ought to have remembered was that he had killed that giant without a sword in his hand. Since those early days, David had truly become a man of war. But now he sought to equip himself with all the things that played to his own strengths and that played to his hard-won expertise. Did you notice that David now enjoyed carrying symbols of this world's might? David exclaimed, hey, give me the sword of Goliath. There's not another one like that one. What a tragedy. Once upon a time, teenage David had told Goliath, you come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. That name was David's weapon then. Young David had taught faith to both the giant and to God's people. On that day, David said, The Lord does not save with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands, giant. What a tragedy. And it just so happens, church, that the name of Gath, the name of the city, has a very particular meaning. The word Gath means a wine press, a wine press. David's fears and his backsliding had caused him to land in Gath. But how many of you know that with God, things are not always what they seem? And in Gath, in the wine press, God had David right where he wanted him. You see, God wanted to squeeze David in that wine press. He wanted to force David to take a good, hard look at his character and look and say, David, what are you becoming? In that wine press of Gath, God wanted to squeeze the fear and trample the deceit and crush the fleshly confidence out of David. He showed David the folly of acting rashly. He let David know true fear, what other men felt all the time for the first time. He stripped David of all of his confidence in the power of the flesh so that once again, David might become someone who could face a 10-foot tall man armed with only a slingshot. David remembered that no mortal flesh could stand against the Lord. And so he sang about it as he made his way away from Gath. With Gath in the rearview mirror, David said, In God I have put my trust. I will not fear. What can flesh do to me? Whenever you're afraid, don't give in to the flesh. Trust in the power of God. What were David's steps of faith when he was afraid? Trust in God. Trust in the word of God. Trust in the power of God. And finally this, when you're afraid, trust in the mercies of God and break out of your funk. <laughs> David was disheartened. He was down in the mouth. And now he might have been tempted just to give up. He had a bigger problem than Saul or Edomites or even Goliath's brothers who were still around somewhere. No, church, in David's ultimate crisis, what worried him now was whether God would still hear his cries. After all, weren't these problems of David's own making? Hadn't David picked up Israel's bad habit of trusting in the flesh? You know, Israel trusted in the flesh. Do you remember why they picked King Saul to be king in the first place? Because he was the biggest guy. They trusted in the flesh, and David had picked that up. Hadn't David also swindled the high priest out of a valuable sword? Hadn't he also abandoned his family members to the mercies, the cruel mercies of Saul? Church, how many of you know that guilt and shame can be even more dangerous, even more crippling than our outward enemies? The most dangerous Foes, listen, somebody needs to get this today. The most dangerous foes are the ones who convince me that God won't hear me anymore, so why bother? Yeah. 
The most powerful enemy is the one who can convince me that I'm so far gone that God has cut me off and that he now sees me as undeserving. Alone and trapped in the city of Gath, quite literally held by strong men. Church, David didn't need a bigger sword. What he needed was the mercy of God. I mentioned earlier that David wrote two psalms after his little uh, Philistine vacation. And uh, we've seen that one of them was Psalm 56. The other one is the much better known Psalm 34. In fact, many people are quite familiar with Psalm 34. But I think it becomes more powerful when we consider that David wrote those psalms not just to celebrate his escape... But he wrote Psalm 34 in particular to teach us not to behave the way that he had behaved and not to feel that God has given up on us. That God still has divine mercies up in store for those of us who have blown it the way that David did. Psalm 34 is a work of art. It was designed by David to teach people not to repeat David's mistakes. In fact, David was so desperate for people, especially young people, to learn those lessons that he actually wrote Psalm 34 out as an acrostic. You know what an acrostic poem is? It's a poem that's laid out in a special pattern. Now, our English alphabet's got 26 letters, but Hebrew only has 22 letters. And so when David wrote Psalm 34, he wrote it in 22 verses, and every verse corresponds to a letter of the alphabet. So, for example, the first verse starts with A. The second verse starts with B. You know, when you have to do that, you know, how's the xylophone verse going to come out, right? And so on. David wrote this psalm all the way down the line. So in a masterpiece of writing, David did that all the way through the psalm. Why? So that young people could more easily memorize his lessons and not repeat his mistakes. You can read the whole thing on your own, but... I just want to, as we prepare to close, I'll just share a few verses with you here. And knowing the circumstances behind it, I think these verses will encourage us all the more. So verse 1, David said, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. David was saying, young people, keep praising him all the time. Old people, keep praising him. It'll keep you from discouragement. And if you keep praising the Lord, it'll probably keep you from winding up in gath in the first place. Verse 4, I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. They looked to him and were radiant and their faces were not ashamed. David said, God delivered me from all my fears. And do you remember the shame of David in this story? Do you remember that David defiled his beard? David said, if you keep looking to the Lord, God will wipe away your shame. And no matter how ashamed you felt when you came into this house today, God says, I can make your face radiant. Verse 6, he goes on, this poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. Church, we simply cry out to him, as David said, and the Lord saves us. Now, I know that that sounds like a pretty simple formula for success. In fact, you're probably saying, well, that's kind of a too simple formula for success, but not if you have a living God. If you have a living God who listens to you, then like David said, you can cry out to that living God who loves you and hears you and he will hear and save you. Verse 11, David said, come you children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. You see, David recognized as he thought back about it he said I, I was growing in deceitfulness lying to the high priest about what was happening what I was going through what I needed and so he's telling the young people and telling all, all of us don't let those seeds of deception of deceitful ways take root in our hearts Verse 15, the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their cry. The righteous cry out and the Lord hears and delivers them out of all. Everybody say all. Out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and save such as have a contrite 
spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. And then it'll just end here. The very last verse, number 22, says, the Lord redeems the soul of his servants and none of those who trust in him shall be condemned. You ought to praise him right there. In church, as I read this psalm, when you know the story behind it, I am struck by the fact that this psalm was written by a man in big trouble. I'm glad that the righteous cry out and the Lord hears them, and that's certainly a great promise. But what about you and me? What if we don't especially feel very righteous today? We love the Lord, but you see, we don't always quite know where we stand in our heart. We can be tripped up by guilt and shame. David was a righteous man, but he messed up badly. He was veering off into sin, and he wasn't seeking the Lord. He was just running away. And when you're just running, you make mistakes. You do stupid things. You might go to Africa dressed like a zebra. You might find yourself trapped in Gath like David. Leaning on his own wisdom got him cornered in Goliath's hometown, needing to weasel his way out of a sticky situation. Maybe you're here this morning and you honestly don't believe that you deserve God's mercies and you messed up. You were young, you were scared. Maybe you just had a moment of weakness under pressure. David learned, and you can learn also, that our God is still a God of mercy. David said, none of those who trusted him shall be condemned, and that's good news. God helped David when he simply cried out for help, and he can help you too. You know that after David escaped from Gath that day, he was a changed man. God is so good. After David cried out, we read that God just kept on helping him more and more. It was like a snowball. He just kept helping him and helping him. David made it out of the wine press of Gath, and he came to the cave of Adullam, which means a refuge. Some men in trouble joined him there. And that was the real beginning of David's kingly ministry of molding discontented people into champions. Next, we read that God found a place for David's parents to hide in Mizpah, which means a watchtower. Then a prophet named Gad showed up and gave David some Holy Spirit guidance. No more reckless ideas for David. The prophet told him exactly where to go. He sent David to the forest of Hereth, and the forest of Hereth was smack dab in the middle of Israel. But David was safe there. Why? Because God was there. Hereth is related to the word for quietness. You see, church, Saul might have been walking around nearby, but now David had spirit-led security. God took David on a beautiful progression from being crushed in the wine press all the way over to a place of quietness. Oh, and by the way, never, never again in the scriptures do we read that David feared any man. It only says that he feared the Lord. God can help you just the same way he helped David, just as he did for David. He can give you new ministry opportunities. He can give you new friends. He can give you a new place of safety. He can take care of your family just like he did for David. He can give you some fresh prophetic guidance. He can take you to that peaceful forest. You know what's good about the forest? Sure, it's peaceful, but with all those leaves on the ground like we have at this time of year, you know you can hear the enemy coming a mile away. So fear and anxiety will lose their torment in your life. He's a faithful God, and he shows mercy even to people who have really blown it and wind up in the city of the Philistines. Because church, you see, it has never been about our merits. It has always been about his mercies. One more thing he does, and I like this the best of all. He changes me. He changes you. Now, more than ever, after this Gath experience, David would now grow into the man after God's own heart. We know about David if 
We've been around a while. We've read our Bibles. Bibles, Bible readers know that David is famous for how he sought after God. But you know that before David went down to Gath and had that bad weekend, we never saw David inquiring of the Lord before. Only now, in chapter 23 of 1 Samuel, we see him for the first time asking God what to do before he makes a move. And now, before he engaged the enemy, David would say, Lord, should I? David had all the skills. He had all the experience of battle. He had all the courage that was required to do great things for God and to make big decisions. But now he wanted to know first, was God in it? And what was God's timing? Friends, no matter where you're at today, no matter what's coming at you, no matter how you think you might have ruined things, don't throw in the towel. After reflecting back on a very bad day in Gath and in a mess of his own making, David concluded that magnificent Psalm 34 with this line, none of those who trust in him will be condemned. Church, trust in the mercies of God, trust in the power of God, trust in the word of God, and trust in the living God who cares for you. May we all rise up in faith like David and say, whenever I am afraid, I will trust in you. Come on, stand together with me, and let's give Jesus a hand clap of praise in his house. Come on and praise him.